Hello, and welcome back to another exciting video. I've just been on my first long trip on this bike, uh, about 700 miles over three days, up through the Yorkshire Dales, North Pennines, and I even sneaked over the border into Scotland, so don't tell Nicky. Anyway, just a few thoughts on my experiences on this trip with this bike. For me, this bike has genuine all-day comfort. I'm really pleased. I did, of course, have aches and pains, um, but the next morning I was feeling fine. If I'd done this on my V7, I'd probably be in a wheelchair right now. To be clear, this isn't a criticism of the V7. They're great bikes, it's just the riding position didn't really suit me. Anything over an hour on that was just painful. I know plenty of people find the V7 perfectly comfortable, um, but for me, the V85 is just a much better riding position. Screen, yeah, it worked pretty well with the um, the little visor thing. Does a great job keeping the flies off. Although the ones that did get past seem to head straight into the air vent on top of my helmet and then spent the rest of their lives crawling around on top of my head, which was nice. I do think in hot weather I might be wishing for a smaller screen. Although I can probably live with that for the three days a year in Wales where it might be a problem. There was a bit of rain. And water doesn't really get cleared off my helmet visor. Um, I'll have to keep an eye on that and see whether it's something I need to find a fix for. Cruise control on the motorway. Yes. Love cruise control on motorbikes. I know a lot of people think, oh, it takes away from the riding experience. But if you just need to do some motorway miles, it's much more relaxing. And the miles just seem to fly by. The, the bike just eats up the miles, really. The most I did was 250 in a day. I know a lot of you from the USA will scoff at that tiny amount, but all I will say is our roads are not like your roads. And 250 miles isn't bad going for a day. Um, the bike would happily do double that, and I could probably do double that on this bike, no problem. The longer travel suspension over the V7 was a definite bonus on the bumpy bits in the Dales and the Pennines. I cranked up the rear preload one notch just because I had the luggage on board. I don't know whether it made a much of a difference. I can imagine you would need to do that if you had a pillion as well, definitely. Front brakes, really good, bedded in nicely now. Good feel and power. Again, much like with the V7, I found they really benefit from a few good hard stops to bed the pads in. And after you've done that, the, the feel and power was much, much improved in my, my experience. Rear brake's okay, I think it's powerful enough, there's not a lot of feel, I've seen that mentioned online by other people. Um, I'm not too worried about it at the moment. I might put some fresh brake fluid in it uh, down the line, we'll see how it goes. There were some vibrations through the bars, but oddly I didn't find this to be an issue. I read somewhere that fitting the engine bars can actually increase the sort of felt vibration. I can kind of see how that might be the case because you're adding extra links between the engine and the frame. I didn't do that many miles before the engine bars are fitted, so I can't really think back and compare whether it made much of a difference or not in reality. I did take bike off-road for a few miles, basically gravel track through the Kielder Forest. Kielder Forest Drive if you're interested. It's good fun. It's only gravel, but I found the bikes really good for standing up, steering through your feet and your knees. I used to do a bit of off-roading, and this weighs an awful lot more than my old KLX 250, but um, yeah, it was pretty good off-road, to be fair. I wouldn't want to take it on really rocky, rutted tracks. I think you'd just be fighting the weight all the time. But for general gravel roads and things like that, it was great. The foot peg rubbers are quite soft and squidgy, and I could feel them moving around a bit more than I'd like when I was standing up. I can see why people that ride off-road a lot would remove them and either fit proper off-road pegs or just remove the rubber parts. Um, but for normal road riding, I would definitely keep them in place. I think they help keep the vibrations down a bit. So I'll talk a little bit about the tank bag I went with when I first got the bike. I think I mentioned it in one of my first videos. As I said before, I'm not a huge fan of the look of the tank ring systems um, where you have a big plastic ring stuck somewhere around the fuel filler. So I was quite intrigued by the Shad pin system when I found it online, as it looks pretty unobtrusive. I got the medium-sized bag, it's the E10P. 
fitting the pins themselves was a little awkward. You have to screw the top part onto a threaded rod. And you can't screw them on very far because it all starts turning. However, they have stayed in place and they have stayed secure, so that doesn't seem to be an issue. I found the bag quite hard to attach at first. I'm not sure why. I was just, just getting it lined up with the pins and keeping it level so you could pull it back and snap into place. But especially on this trip where I was taking it on and off more often, I found you just, it's just, again, it's one of those things you just get used to. So it's not really an issue. Once it's in place, it's very solid and it's never come loose. There is a safety strap, which the instructions are very insistent you must use. I guess they're just covering themselves if for some reason they did get knocked. It's, it's not going to fly off down the road. It's just going to fly around your handlebars and I'm sure that won't cause any problems. One of the issues I found was it does actually foul the handlebars on full lock. Don't know if you can see, but that's, it's not enough to be an issue and cause control problems, but it does touch. The bag is as far back as it can physically fit. Also where I've got the sat nav mounted at the moment, that hits the bag as well. I will be looking into getting a bar above the main instruments to mount sat nav, but at the moment I just kind of bodged it in place there with a, a ram mount. Access to the key is a real pain as well because the bag is quite tight up to the bars. So you've got to reach around and fiddle to try and get the damn key turned. There is a phone holder section on top, which is too small for any modern phone. I don't have a particularly fancy phone, as you can tell by the quality of this video. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's just typical with a lot of these things. They, they were designed some years ago, and I think and, uh, phones have got bigger. I did find with the sun up high in the sky, I was getting reflections off the top of the tank bag, the clear plastic cover shining up into my eyes at certain times of the day. That was a bit annoying. But um, In summary, having said all that, it is a pretty good system, actually. I do like the, the way it works. And the bag itself seems to be of high quality. You lose a bit of space inside with the mounting system. I suspect that's similar for some of the tank ring systems as well. There's some sort of locking mechanism in the bottom of the bag, so you're just going to lose that space. It's interesting design, but for me personally, it doesn't suit the V85 very well. It's just with the shape of the tank and where the fuel filler is, it doesn't really work. I'm sure it's great. I'm sure it works fine on other bikes, but it just doesn't fit very well on the V85 in my opinion. There is a smaller bag, I think the E5, which maybe wouldn't have the same clearance issues. And there is a larger bag as well, which I definitely wouldn't go for on this bike if you get this system. This this E10 bag is probably the biggest, definitely, that I would try and fit here. I'll be honest, I will probably look into one of the tank ring systems later on and fit that instead, just to have a bit more practicality out of it. So if anyone can recommend one of the brands, I will look into those. I also got myself a shad top box. Again, because the mounting plate system was fairly unobtrusive compared to some of the other manufacturers. You have to fit some brackets to the existing rack on the V85 and then the plastic plate will fit onto those brackets. I'll stick a couple of photos in somewhere. Fitting was a bit of a pain due to fiddly access. The mounting kit fits the bike okay with four screws but to fit the plate to the kit two of the holes are threaded and two are not and clearance to get nuts on the back around the frame was really minimal it was all just a bit fiddly um, if they would used welded on nuts or threaded holes and be done with it, it would have made life a lot easier i wonder if they've adapted a fitting kit from a different bike and just actually haven't put too much thought into it but it got on in the end and it's stayed secure so that's good one thing i did find is the mounting kit for the V85 only works with the larger size shad plates, so that's something to bear in mind. This top box that I bought is the SH34, and it comes with a small plate, and I couldn't fit it. So I got in touch with the place I bought it from. They didn't understand what was wrong either. They got in touch with shad. Long story short, for the V85, you need them the larger sized plates, and they've since updated their website to say that, because they didn't know either. So I will give some kudos to bikeluggage.co.uk um, for having good customer service and sorting me out. They were very helpful. No affiliation with them, that's just where I bought the shad item.
the box itself fits firmly onto the plate as you'd hope. It seems well made, pretty sturdy. The only issue really is the, the lid can rattle a little bit, um, which is slightly annoying. There's no foam or rubber seals inside, but it does seem waterproof. It's got the usual sort of double lip design that most luggage has these days. As I said, I got the SH34, 34 litre top box because, because I didn't want a giant dustbin on the back of the bike. I just wanted something small and unobtrusive. In hindsight, yes, a bigger top box would have been more practical. Um, so I may well end up buying a larger box for longer trips and keep this one for shorter day trips where I just need somewhere to stash the crash helmet. Having said that, I do have a terrible habit of filling all the available space. So if I fitted a big top box, I would start carrying tons more crap with me. So swings and roundabouts. One useful feature of the shad box is, is you don't actually have to leave it locked all the time. You can leave it in an unlocked state and take the key out. That can be useful sometimes. As I mentioned, there's a, just a little bit of movement on the lid. I may try fitting something, a bit of foam draft seal or something in there to stop that. Box opens up quite easily, as you'd expect. Again, this is 34 litre one, so not a huge amount of space inside. Just enough for a day trip, really. All seems good. So, in summary then. This bike is a brilliant mile muncher. It just eats up the miles. It's got all day comfort. So, so far, it's exactly what I was hoping it would be. If you're expecting a buttery smooth engine and ride, then just get a Japanese four cylinder bike, to be honest. You know, this is a motor gutsy. You should know what you're getting into with these. It makes some nice noises. There's a nice throaty induction noise when you wind the throttle on. A few farts and pops on the overrun. I suspect that's to do with Euro 4 emissions. I wonder what the Euro 5 bikes are like. I assume there's a lot of lean running going on to get through the emissions tests. The rear tyre is nicely squared off now after 700 miles, even, uh, even though there was a lot of twisties in the Dales and the Pennines. I think that's just a feature of doing any length of time on a motorway. You've just got to live with it. Still plenty of tread left on it, though. This bike, it feels like it's a keeper, um, or at least the V85 itself i did say that about my v7 though so never say never really we'll see how it goes we'll have to see whether any of the faults you see in the online forums and pages actually turn up like oil leaks and sensor faults and if they do how well the dealer network and piaggio deal with them because that experiences of owners seems to have been quite variable so far one thing i noticed while i was out on my trip was that so many GS BMWs around. It was nice to be riding something a bit different, if I'm honest. I understand why. Their GSs are great bikes, obviously. But everyone's got one, so it's nice to be a little bit different. I'll put some links to the Shad top box and tank bag in the description down below. I've no affiliation with bikeluggage.co.uk. They've no idea who I am. I just got good service off them. So why not support companies that actually look after their customers? That's what I'd say. Oh, two other thoughts just occurred to me. It could do with a bit of a fender extender under the number plate because a lot of crap does get thrown up off the road over the top box and onto the pillion seat if the top box wasn't there. I had the same issue with my old Multistrada. It doesn't need to be much, just a little lip under the number plate to catch the worst of the crap coming off the back tyre would do the job. Also, I'm convinced I could feel the weight balance changing as the fuel level went down. On my final trip home, I filled up at the start and didn't fill up again for the rest of the trip. And I'm sure I could feel the weight changing on the bike as the fuel dropped right down. It's currently showing 22 miles range, and I've done about 260 miles, I think. So that ties in roughly with the expected range of the bike. Thanks for watching. I've just now got to work out how to get this bike off its scent stand with it facing uphill. What could possibly go wrong?